uh, for anybody that's joining us, we're going to kick off in about a minute. Just give a bit more time for people to come into the room. Can you all hear me, by the way? I'm talking. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, okay, everybody, I think we're going to um, get going. We've got a packed um, agenda, so I want, I want to uh, get into it uh, as quickly as we can and hand over to the speakers. Um, I just want to welcome everybody to our Can Digital Save the High Street event. Uh, the Essex and Hearts Digital Innovation Zone is delighted to be taking part in <coughs> Digital Leaders Week. It's already been a fantastic week of talks. Uh, and this morning, we're actually particularly happy to be um, involved with digital leaders. Uh, as last night, we were thrilled to have been named Cross Sector Collaboration of the Year in the Digital Leaders Awards. So we're we're we're, uh, we're uh, very very happy today, uh, and hopefully, this will be the first of um, many events over the, over the coming year. And um, we are recording the session, uh, so you'll be able to. Uh, revisit the content uh, at a later date that will be made available by digital leaders and anybody who's unable to make the live session will also be able to replay it. Um, now the future of our high streets is, is of critical importance to all of the partners across the DIS or digital innovation zone uh, and we have pulled together a fantastic panel of speakers uh, for you today to help to help shape uh, how you and we respond to the challenge. I'm sure you'll hear lots to inspire you. Inspire you. Um, I'm going to start by handing over to our host for the event, Julian Gibbs from Anglia Ruskin University, who have been a, a partner and support, a, a supporter of the DIS from our earliest days. Julian works for the Research and Innovation Development Office at ARU, where he creates and manages partnerships with the public, private and third sector. So, um, Julian, uh, over to you. And uh, thank you, Mike, and, and welcome, colleagues, and good morning to today's Digital Innovation Zone event, How Can Digital Save the High Street, which is part of our Digital Leaders Week. I'm Julian Gibbs from Anglo Ruskin University, your chair for this morning's event. Anglo Ruskin, as Mike has indicated, is a key partner to the Digital Innovation Zone, and we're pleased to be jointly working with partners across business, health, education, local government, and the third sector in making our place, West Essex and East Hertfordshire, ready to respond to the challenges and opportunities ahead. I would like to thank officers and colleagues for the invitation today and for the work in which they put on in organizing such an stimulating event, which I'm sure you'll agree will be enlightening and fascinating as we move through the session. At a time when our high streets are facing unprecedented challenges, in today's event, we will look at how digital can help support the traditional high streets to make the most of online opportunities, maximize engagement through social media and drive footfall by giving shoppers the confidence to return. Taking part in today's event, we have three experts in their field. We have Polly Barnfield OBE, CEO at Maybe, one of the companies that has been selected to contribute to the UK government's High Street Task Force, and who provides tools that enables organizations to know their customers better, communicate with them efficiently, and to measure the impact of their social media activity. Polly was named as one of the 100 most influential women in technology by Computer Weekly magazine and founders Give As You Like, a leading nonprofit fundraising platform. Welcome, Polly. We're also joined by Jenny Nelson, who is the Digital Newcastle Programme Manager at Newcastle City Council, named as the Digital Leader Smart City of the Year in 2019 for its innovative approach in using technology to help transform services and improve the lives of residents. The Digital Newcastle programme plays a key role in connecting organisations across the city 
including the public, private, academic and voluntary sectors to deliver collaborative projects to help Newcastle to be a smarter, faster and more productive place. Welcome, Jenny. And finally, we have Emma Jones, MBE, founder of the Enterprise Nation, which since launching in 2005 has helped thousands of people start and grow their businesses. Enterprise Nation continues to be the most active UK small business community and a leading campaigning voice for small businesses. Emma was one of the eight co-founders of Launch Startup Britain, the national campaign to encourage more people to start a business and support existing businesses to grow. Welcome, Emma. Thanks, Julia. Each of our speakers will have 10 minutes to present, after which there will be an opportunity for questions. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker today, Polly. Thank you, Julian. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so here you go. Let's see if the technology works. It's always a, always a lucky moment, isn't it? There you go. Brilliant. Well, thank you all. Um, it's lovely to be in such esteemed company. And let me talk you through, uh, maybe, um, as Julian said, we're, we're one of the High Street Task Force partners. And what we deliver to the High Street Task Force is a dashboard that helps places understand what people are saying on social media. Because we believe the High Street very much has a future, but it's very much driven by the machine that everybody has in their hand. Um, and the reason that, uh, the thing that keeps me uh, awake at night is this fact, which is that today, 66% of UK consumers use social media for an average of two hours and 54 minutes per day. It's their window on the world, it's their primary channel of communication. Now, the thing that bothers me most is because we can see this on a daily basis, we know that the, we, 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 we look at the data from Google, so we identify over 2.9 million organisations from Google Maps. We go back every night and collect, I missed, I missed a slide, hang on, I'm going to go back, something jumped, technology has failed us. Here we go. Um, so, as I said, 66% of consumers use social media for an average of two hours and 54 minutes per day. What keeps me awake at night is that only 28% of SMEs use social media on a daily basis. They may well have an account, but they don't use it on a daily basis. So there's a huge gap. This graph at the bottom shows the gap between chains and independent businesses. And the blue line at the bottom is independent businesses. This drop off was when lockdown first happened. Um, we were concerned pre-lockdown that only 40% of businesses use social media on a daily basis. And now it's sitting at 28%. And that really worries us. How do we know that's true? Because as I said, we've crawled Google um, and we now can look at 2.9 million businesses across the UK on a daily basis. We collect their Twitter, Facebook and Instagram data and then we pump it through a whole smart load of tools that lets people understand, is the conversation good, bad, what's people saying, how does it work? And we're also now connecting this with Visa and MasterCard data, which gives us a really great view of what that conversation that consumers are having on a daily basis and how it impacts businesses. So we've taken all that data and pumped it through a set of tools that enable businesses to access for free so they can understand what this data means and learn how to connect it with their business and learn how social media delivers business results. Because I think often it can be put on the back shelf and thought of as a nice to have, not a must have. Now I'm gonna share with you three case studies that shows you why I believe it is in a, in a world where become, we're becoming all more disconnected an absolute must have. Um, and they, these are three These are three, three businesses, one of which is not on the high street, but one is very relevant. So Primark is, is exciting, I think, in the sense of this case study, because it is a national business that has no e-commerce. So it was actually like most SMEs during lockdown. It couldn't sell a thing. Gymshark is an SME that went from zero to a billion dollar business in eight years. And Keith Garrett is a true SME that has beaten their revenue numbers through COVID through using social media. So in the spirit of speed, social media enabled Primark not to close. They didn't sell anything because they couldn't, but when they opened up, they had a queue. So we dived into the data and said, well, why did Primark have a queue when other people didn't have a queue? Now granted, they have so much right with their business. They have the right product, they sell it to the right customer, but they treated their customers really well through lockdown. They didn't try and sell them anything. They showed them how to celebrate um, lockdown. They showed them how to do Zoom calls. They showed them what to wear for a Zoom call. They helped them do their makeup. They helped them celebrate birthdays alone. They really delivered content that spoke to their audience. And what the data showed is that their audience kept talking to them. The graph down the bottom right is what people were saying about Primark during lockdown. 
and their customers were doing the talking for them. They didn't miss a beat, they doubled down, they responded to every comment, content, a comment, and they, although they weren't selling anything, served their customer. So there's a high street retailer that understood you could serve through social, even though you weren't selling. And for, my, for me, digital is often thought of as an e-commerce channel, when actually it's the absolute ally of the, of the high street. Here's what they're doing now, and clearly they're selling product again, and people are turning up and buying it. We've, we then looked at a range of independent businesses and said, well, if, can we see a similar pattern um, to Primark? Can we find businesses that actually thumped it during lockdown? And the answer was yes, we found num a number of them. I just share the data very briefly for an independent business called Keith Garrett, who will share our revenue data with us, which is great. Thank you very much, Sophie Scarrett. Um, and the purple line here is her orders over time during the COVID period. And you can see how the purple line goes above the gray line. Now she, when lockdown happened, stopped doing everything because she thought she couldn't sell in store or online because she thought lockdown meant she couldn't even do online. She sells expensive shoes. And I'm gonna talk you through how she actually did this. How did she end up selling more during lockdown than she did when the store was open? So her, she's very conscious that her clients are terribly loyal. She sells beautiful, expensive Italian shoes. So when COVID crisis was announced, she turned her um, spend off. You can see how her spend flatlined this pink line here is her social media spend. This had an impact on her sales and they stopped, which is also reassuring. So they turned her marketing off and she stopped selling. Um, but she noticed that because she'd stopped running ads, she's, the light purple graph here is engagement data. She spent much more time engaging with the local conversation, um, resharing charity content, talking about what everybody was doing during, during lockdown, um, just generally engaging in the conversation around Cheltenham. And she noticed on the graph on the right, far right, that her sentiment spiked. And you can see here around the 6th of April, how her sentiment spiked up. Now this is before she turned her ads on. And she thought, that's interesting. People are liking the fact I'm engaging. I'm gonna get brave. And it gave her the confidence to turn her ads on. And suddenly she saw this enormous spike and she ended up beating her previous month's sales and her previous year's sales. And she ended up ordering 600 new pairs of shoes that she hadn't ordered to sell during normal times during April. But she did it all through social selling and she did it because she understood her customer and what they wanted. And she has now gone on to do some lovely PR actually around this saying how by understanding what her customers were, what was, were saying enabled her to make a bold decision during lockdown that's enabled her to sell more than she could have before. And this is not a standalone case. It's, we see it many, many times. It was, it was through st strategic spend of ads that she's enabled herself to sell more product. So she spent 6,700 pounds on ads and delivered herself 54,000 pounds back. And that was one ad. And it's because she understood her customer and she understood the data all through social. Gymshark, SME to 1 billion in eight years. And they've done it through social. 19 year old Ben Francis started making product in his garage. He understood there was a gap in the market. He built fashionable clothes at an affordable price for an age range that wanted to look good in the gym. He took on Nike and Adidas and chose not to use JD and ASOS as sales channels. Staggering story. And he did it. Yes, he had the right product. Yes, he got many things right. But he used social as a way to sell. And he decided to sponsor 18 influencers who had a combined following of 20 million people. And he's absolutely smashed it. So my message is very simple, which is use social to know who your customer is. Um, we, we provide the tools to do that for free to get started. Um, and we've now combined that with Visa and MasterCard data. And we're hoping we can fill the black hole in retail, which is saying, do you know what online piece of activity has enabled you to deliver an offline sale? Because once you can fill that hole, you can start to say, right, I know how to spend my money to make more people buy my product. But you have to know your customer. The other thing we do is enable you to follow, follow in the footsteps of giants. So you can compare your data to somebody like Gymshark or Sophie Scarrett and watch what they're doing. Because the hardest thing to know is what's right. We work with local authorities across the UK um, to help places understand how to make their social media work because every place is the sum of its digital parts. Um, and so having all the data to understand what the best in place looks like means that we can deliver weekly webinars or we do a roadshow around the UK and say, this is what good looks like because the customer is here. This is the high street. It doesn't mean it's e-commerce, but you've got to consider digital as a communication channel that brings people to place. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Polly. That, that was excellent. Uh, 
and then you know fascinating because uh, I've seen it firsthand when uh, we came out of lockdown how many people were uh, queuing outside my local Primark so an, an amazing campaign so, so so thank you very much for that we, we now move over to uh, to Jenny uh, from Newcastle City Council uh, the floor is yours Jenny fantastic thank you um, I'll just get my slides There we are. And um, that was fascinating, wasn't it? Wow, blimey. Um, bit of a bit of a task to follow. Thanks, Folly. Um, so um, my name's Jenny Nelson. I'm the Digital Newcastle Programme um, Manager at Newcastle City Council. And what I want to do today is talk about a project that we've had uh, running for the last few months, which is um, howbusyistune.com. But before I do that, I'll just build on um, some of the the introduction, I guess, that Julian gave around uh, what we're doing in Newcastle generally. And to be honest, what I feel sort of laid the foundations for us to be able to spring up something like How Busy Is Tomb pretty swiftly. So this uh, visual image, this picture sort of highlights the breadth of activity within the Digital Newcastle programme. So from supporting digital skills and inclusion to delivering and enabling significant connectivity investment, whether that's fibre or um, mobile or, or 5G, um, to creating economic opportunities for tech SMEs and helping them scale up, to not surprisingly, um, given my council role, delivering better public services as well. But it's very much a city innovation programme and one that's evolved from quite a narrow focus on um, a transaction, I guess, between the customer and uh, a customer and the council. So, you know, digital as a transaction actually now we recognise that digital really has a, a key role within all of our place-based activity, recognising that the challenges that we face in the city today, so whether that's um, ageing or climate change, um, dealing with a, a, a huge pandemic um, or ec and the economic renewal off the back of that just can't be solved by one organisation. It really needs that sort of multi-partner approach that we're trying to drive within Newcastle. So we do have a really strong um, tech sector. We also have some really great academic assets as well. So particularly focused around our Newcastle Helix site, which is our in, uh, innovation zone in the city. And that is actually home to the National Innovation Centre for Data and the Urban Observatory. And I'll come on to that in a minute. But as Julia mentioned, I guess one of the things that we like about Newcastle is the way that we bring partners together. So whether that's the university, whether that's tech SMEs, whether that's council, citizens, public sector, private sector, whoever, we're trying to bring people together. And I do think that with what stores recognised last year as the digital leaders smart city. So smart for us is about delivering outcomes. It's not necessarily about just deploying tech. Um, and certainly um, the work we were doing around how busy is too and was very much about improving people's experiences of the city, um, but also obviously that, you know, a big economic side as well. So how do we continue to promote Newcastle as a place for tech investment and growth? How do we support economic renewal within the city? And how do we encourage other people to come and do trials in Newcastle as well? And, and ultimately trials and test beds should really be focused on data. And we're really lucky in Newcastle to have an absolute wealth of data um, lots of urban data. We have the Urban Observatory, which is the largest source of urban open data in Europe. And the metrics that they have is absolutely staggering. So it's sort of 2.3 billion smart building observations, 120 million real time bus locations, 190 air quality devices, 15,000 building data streams, you know, just huge numbers. But actually, what's interesting for me is not the number of data sets that we have available. It's actually that their strap line is evidence for change because actually what we're trying to do in Newcastle is take all of this data and do something with it so whether that's master planning the city in terms of um, transport and mobility whether it's about measuring interventions so we can put things in place but we know we have a very clear baseline and we can see the impact that that's had and um, it means that we can take you know we're capturing lots of of, of data about the city with football obviously being a really sort of key um, data set that perhaps before COVID um, people weren't that interested in unless you were unless you were I guess within that retail core environment and um, certainly I, I don't think people were generally looking up data on the urban observatory site and what they tried is so it's fair to say that within the, the pandemic really sort of brought the urban observatory to everybody's clear attention in the city 
and they were pulling together all sorts of graphs and um, data sets about football, about car parking. Um, but it's fair to say that it's not really the most accessible format at the minute. Um, so certainly where we, the sort of challenge that we had was how do we take the data that we have in the city and the really rich intelligence that we have and turn it into something that's actually accessible and usable and will help people within the city. And I guess, you know, faced with the, the, the pandemic, you know, how can we test the hypothesis that there's something beneficial we can do with this data that can help respond to the challenges of the pandemic and not least obviously the horror story, I guess, facing the high street. Um, and if you know Newcastle, you might recognize this as Northumberland Street. It's our main sort of retail, one of our main retail areas. And certainly in Newcastle, I might, I might say this, but if hopefully if you've been then you'll know, um, we are known for our sort of Geordie hospitality. So getting people into the city centre, into pubs, restaurants, shops, um, generates millions and millions of pounds for the, for the city, both from obviously our domestic and tourist market as well. So it's fair to say that getting people into the city safely is a, is a big challenge that we were grappling with. So we decided that, right, well, we've got four clear user needs there. So as a resident, we need, I need to feel safe so that I can confidently come into the city centre. As a retailer, I need shoppers to return so I can maintain my business. As a local authority, we need residents to feel safe to come into the city centre to sustain economic recovery, uh, you know, generate growth, protect jobs. And we also have a business improvement district as well. So they're clearly looking to drive customer footfall to help businesses stay sustainable. Um, and what we've decided to do is uh, bring our sort of smart city collaboration work together with this challenge and develop a very rough and ready zero cost uh, minimum viable product to test and understand some of those needs. And, and what we did was working with the National Innovation Centre for Data, working with the data at the Urban Observatory, the business intelligence of our, um, of any one, our business improvement district and the council as well. We developed a very simple traffic light system that took the real time data from the urban observatory on how busy um, our main sort of shopping street was and provided that back to people as a red, amber or green around the data shows that football is low, medium or high and a suggestion about um, social distancing. We also had parking, real time parking information as well, which we were able to share as a bit of an indication of, of how busy it is. And we were really, really thrilled um, with the feedback. So um, other cities got in touch. We had, you know, 600,000 reach, um, 25,000 hits on the site. Um, definitely, we only promoted it through social. So very much following Polly's point about the power of social in terms of getting this on people's radar. And not surprisingly, people started making suggestions um, about things we might be able to consider. My personal favourite is, I wish they had this in Ikea. And I think it just showed you it's not rocket science. It was taking the data. We already had the data let presented in a way that, that people might actually use. Um, and for me, I guess, the beta release demonstrated, and we really did knock it together in the space of weeks, um, demonstrated citizen data and citizen interest in data, that if it's shared in a way that's meaningful for them, you know, that was data that had been available for years and nobody had looked at it, make it available to people in a way that's useful and they're interested in that. And it was perfect timing really that the digital fund from MHCRG came along and we pitched into that um, and we were able to actually um, get some funding from that um, fund to scale up and share, knowing that there's a short-term impact that we could help support economic recovery in the city, but also about actually, well, what does it tell us about how people want to access data in the city? And it's fair to say that we, so we, we contracted with a local company called Hedgehog Lab, um, who took us right back to the start. And look, here we are. Here's another picture of a queue outside of Primark. Um, so I think every city must have one. But Hedgehog took us right back to user research. So they went, they spoke to people. I think we had about three or 400 questionnaires um, filled in really about, you know, have you been back into the city? Um, how did you feel about coming to the city? What could be managed better? You know, what would you like to see? Where would you go for data to help inform you about a visit to the city? And it's fair to say that people are feeling a real mix of emotions at the minute. Um, and about two thirds of the people surveyed had come back into the city centre, which is great. 
but there were some definite tensions that people were experiencing. The main one being around concerns about other people's behaviour, second one being around inconsistent guidance, and the third sort of concerns about public transport as well. So yes, people wanted information on how busy it would be, but that certainly wasn't the only thing that they wanted to know. They wanted information on shops and restaurants, and they wanted information on um, safety measures as well that would be in place so that they felt confident coming back. And Hedgehog have been helping us um, redesign the site to so take it from that, that initial prototype into something that's actually giving a, you know, it's a new design, not just about busyness, and really sort of playing on the importance of tone of voice, of language, of colour, of you know, not being alarming, making sure that it's seen as trustworthy. And that was something that came through, you know, a bit of a concern about are they really telling me the truth here? Um, and accessible as well. So we now have, we will have um, four parts of the site, not just that we will have the busyness, but we're going to plug in a video there as well so people can make a decision themselves about how busy they think it is. We're going to have a, um, more information about the safety measures that are in place or what people can expect when they come in. We're also going to hook into um, Google Maps so that people can find more information about the actual places that they want to visit and we're going to have information separately on public transport as well so we will still plug through the the car parking data but we'll also link to um other transport providers who are also providing covid related data as well and kind of make it a place where people can go and find out um you know how to come into the city center and and pull in all of that data as well so that's the sort of mock-up of the site as it is at the minute and um, what next? Well, we're still in the project. You can find out more about the project on our web page. We've got a final show and tell um, in a week or so's time. Um, so please get in touch if you're interested in, in seeing that. And really the best thing about the, the fact that this project is funded by MHCLG, it, did it, it makes it an open source product. So this will be available for other cities and towns to use and plug in their own data and their own data sets and their own information. And, and, and use the same sort of templates to share that data with people um, in their cities. And I think that's going to be really, you know, could be really important at this time of year in the lead up to Christmas when high, high streets are generally buzzing with activity. How do we make sure that people feel as confident and comfortable um, coming into the city centre as they can? And that's me. Thank you very much, Jenny. I mean, there's some incredibly powerful and positive messages coming through there, which is really fantastic. So congratulations to you and officers in, in Newcastle. And I mean, I'll be looking at uh, uh, watching this closely once it's, uh, you know, we can access it once it goes live. So it's fan fantastic. So congratulations. Fantastic. Uh, now move on to, to Emma. Uh, so Emma, very much the, the floor is yours uh, and welcome again. Amazing. Thank you so much, Julian. It feels like a, a wonderful digital hostings event going on today. <laughs> uh, so um, as, as being the third person on, uh, that means I think I've got about three minutes to talk. <laughs> but um, lovely to be here with everyone. Um, my name's Emma Jones, just for those who joined a little bit later following Julian's introduction. So my name's Emma Jones, founder of Enterprise Nation. Uh, we are a company that helps people start and grow their own small business. So I guess I'm a little bit biased on the premise that I'm going to offer today, which is when it comes to digital and the high street, I think small businesses have got a critical role to play in that, but also the big technology companies that have enabled small businesses to start and grow. So I'll kind of talk you through that, uh, through illustrating a couple of projects uh, that we've run. Um, and forgive me, I'm not quite sure who the audience is today, but I'm hoping, and I've been following the questions, I think it's a lot of people from local authorities. So what I'm hoping is certainly um, from the experience that I'm going to mention around a campaign called Clicks and Mortar, it might give some useful information if this is something you're considering for your area. So um, first of all, to cover this project that you can see on the slide before you, um, as a business, we have worked for a number of years with Amazon. And again, I think it's really interesting when there's discussion around digital and the high street, some people, dare I say, and with great respect, can oversimplify it by saying things like Amazon are bad, high street physical retail is good. But I guess where we come from is actually, if you blend the two together, you get even greater benefits on both sides. So if I explain, so we had worked with Amazon for a number of years on a programme called the Amazon Academy, 
where we would train thousands of small businesses on how to sell better on Amazon Marketplace. And in 2018, um, Amazon came to us and said, do you think there's anything that we can do in terms of having more of a positive impact on the high street? And many years ago, and again in the introduction, Julian mentioned I used to run something called Startup Britain, which was a, a big kind of national get everyone starting businesses back in 2012. And one thing that we launched as part of that campaign was something called Pop Up Britain, where we opened pop up shops and we filled them with online sellers. And we started that in 2012 and I guess kind of fast forward to 2019, 2018, I was still quite surprised that we hadn't got kind of a universal offer in the UK that helped online sellers easily test physical retail. So in June 2019, we came back onto the high street uh, with support from Amazon, you can see the brands on the slide. Direct Line for Business, who gave insurance to our retailers, and Square, who offer mobile payment devices. And we launched this campaign called Clicks and Mortar, where again, we opened up physical shops and we filled them with online sellers. Um, and I'm just going to show you lots of images of the beautiful shops and our sellers. Um, we learned a huge amount. We ran from, we were due to be running for 12 months. We ran from June 2019. Of course, sadly, we had to close our final shop in Leeds in March of this year when we went into lockdown. But across that period, we did learn so much in terms of essentially how do you reduce the friction for a small business who sells online, but as I say, is looking for that opportunity to test physical retail. So as I show you the images of the shops, I'll just talk you through the lessons learned and essentially kind of what the model looked like. So this was our first shop in Manchester. Uh, we did open on the high street in Manchester. It was called St. Mary's Gate. Uh, the branding, as you can see, is very much kind of clicks and mortar. So the customer, we tried to make it very specific in terms of the customer understanding what kind of shop environment they were coming into. And what we would do is we would bring together cohorts of online sellers. So here in the images, you can see the first Manchester cohort. The reason why we did that is lots of points of friction for small businesses when they do think about physical retail is identifying an empty shop, figuring out who the landlord is, then trying to do or convince the landlord to do a temporary kind of pop up license, then getting the legals of that done figuring out how to fill the space, both kitting it out from a furnishings perspective, but also of course, so many small business owners just simply don't have enough stock to fill a whole shop. And then of course, there's the rent and the rates that come with it. So we essentially crowdfunded a shop. We would bring in, in Manchester, we took up to 10 businesses. I'll show you in a moment, a picture of our Sheffield shop, which was our biggest shop where we had a cohort of 24 brands who came in and collectively they shared the rent and rates payment. They shared space. So we had lots of amazing deals done between the sellers who came in and met each other. But it also means that they only needed to bring sufficient stock for their particular part of the shop. Um, our second shop was in a shopping centre, um, so uh, I know this is a big cohort of Polly's clients, so we went into St David's Centre in Cardiff. This was a whole new experience, and again, if there's any shopping centres tuned into the session today, um, the big piece of feedback we had from this experience is, whereas when we were on the high street, a big thing that these sellers have to do is they're only in the shop for two weeks and therefore they literally have to get onto the street to encourage in customers and they definitely use social again one of our biggest sellers who we ever had in the shops was a beautiful business called Calla Shoes the way in which she attracted in customers is she reached out to all of her social media following she said you can come and meet me in Manchester for this couple of weeks and that worked really well but we also encouraged our sellers to go out and do guerrilla marketing you may have seen in Manchester we had a scooter maker so we said to him scoot around the city fly over the customers and attract them in but when we went into a shopping center uh, none of the sellers were allowed to do anything outside of the shop so uh, lessons learned from that one we have now uh, since fed all of that back to Landsec to say one of the things if you want more experiential entrepreneurial tenants to come and be incubated in your space is you do need to let them experiment a bit and just as a final story on that you can see the lovely picture of the chap uh, second on the top line, he runs a business called Vitsticks, 
And when we were day two in Cardiff, he was sampling his product just outside the shop. So he was kind of using it as this opportunity to attract people in. This is before the security guards told us we couldn't do it. And um, walking past was the finance director of Holland and Barrett. So, the, and of course, Tom, who's the entrepreneur behind Vitsticks, didn't know who this person was. He said, oh, sir, can I welcome you and, and get you to ch try a Vitsticks? Anyway, end of that story is, is that Vitsticks is now stocked in Holland and Barrett because of that kind of chance encounter. So it just kind of goes to show by doing, encouraging that kind of guerrilla marketing, you never quite know who the business owner is going to meet. Um, we then moved to Scotland. Again, we went into a shopping centre here, which was a really entrepreneurial one. Um, it's Morgarth is the landlord in Waverley Mall. Uh, they enabled us to do services, uh, lock-ins. We did um, in-store events. And the more that you can do, forgive me if I'm preaching to the converted, but of course, the more experience experiences and events you can put in store, the more that attracts in the customers. One other thing to mention that was a big part of the Clicks and Mortar model, and I think this comes to today's agenda, which is we would host um, accounting sessions in the shop. So every two weeks, we would bring in accountants who would deliver accounting advice to our Clicks and Mortar retailers, but we would also open up that opportunity to neighboring retailers. And a big thing that we wanted Clicks and Mortar to do is both offer online retailers the opportunity to pop up physically, but we also wanted to deliver digital training to existing online retailers. So to try and uh, deliver for kind of both of those audiences. This was our Sheffield shop where um, we had an incredible partnership with Sheffield Council actually on this shop. Sheffield Council approached us. They said, we want you to bring Clicks and Mortar to Sheffield. And the reason I show these pictures, just a couple of reasons, I guess one, it was very sad to see the demise of Maplin moving off the high street, but I guess this is where we wanted to show, but actually small businesses, if given the support and the infrastructure can equally well move in. But the second reason I wanted to show this shop is by the point of Sheffield, we had also identified another point of friction that we had not necessarily created, but we hadn't identified, which is when you ask a business owner to come into a shop and sell for two weeks, you're essentially asking them to leave behind their business. And quite a few of the business owners were saying to us, look, I can't do that two week commitment. So in Sheffield, we pivoted to a new model where we put the store management in place. So we had 24 brands in this shop. You can see them here, but we managed the shop. So we put a store manager in. We had a single point of payment through the square terminal, uh, which meant we could then see which was the busiest day and time for sales. And what we did is what we didn't want to lose is when customers come in, they love to meet the actual entrepreneur behind the brand. So what we would do is we'd do meet the seller events, where on a rotor system, each of the entrepreneurs and the sellers did come into store, then the customers could meet them in person, but then they could head home and continue to run their online business. Here in the Sheffield store, you can see some um, digital training that was being conducted by Business Sheffield. So again, creating for the online seller, definitely a route to market opportunity, but also a training opportunity whilst they were in the shop. Um, this was our final shop, which, as I say, with great sadness, we had to close down when lockdown happened. So we went into Leeds, um, where there's a, an experimental area in this shopping centre, which is for young brands. But the thing that I wanted to mention about this shop, which, as I say, was our final one, is the slightly different approach we took here, which again showed in the sales figures. Every time we kind of improved and iterated, we saw the impact on the sales figures. The approach we took here was having a sector focused shop. So for instance, what you can see on screen is we opened up the lead shop at the new year. So at the beginning of this year, that feels a much longer time ago, but at the start of the year with a whole new you, new year philosophy. And so it was full of wellness and exercise brands. And for the purposes of the customer, that then helped us hone our promotion because we were saying, if you come to Clicks and Water in Leeds, we had an, a big ex-footballer who came in in the first couple of weeks, so he was a bit of a celebrity draw, but it was all around. You can come in, there's athletic fashion here, there's wellness kind of um, events and also products. And that really helped the customer understand, okay, I know what's happening in this shop. I know the kind of brands that I can expect.
So um, like the reason why I kind of want to share that is um, you may kind of think, well, we ever bring clicks and water back to life. And it kind of brings me on to this kind of second and final element of what we're doing at the moment is um, we do feel, and again, I always look for what have been the silver linings that have come out of the past seven months because small businesses by nature are very optimistic so we at Enterprise Nation have a responsibility I think to our community to try and stay positive and one of the huge um, I guess advantages that has come out of lockdown is the massive increase in the number of businesses who are now selling online. So at Enterprise Nation in the past six months we've welcomed over 300,000 small businesses to our platform. Back in early May the massive cry from these small businesses was we want content on how to do more online. We've been a physical business, we need to pivot, we need to get on takeaway apps, we need to build a website, we need to understand social media. And therefore, as a company, we responded and you can just see from this slide, we still run, we've been running them for six months now, daily what we call lunch and learn webinars, 30 minutes, 12 to 12.30, we get about 200 small businesses each day. And you can just see here the topics that we're covering because these are the topics that businesses want to know. And finally, which kind of brings it all back full circle in terms of will there be online sellers to test physical retail in the future. The program that we're now running with Amazon that we launched in July is a national big effort called the Amazon Small Business Accelerator, where we're looking to train 200,000 small businesses. We're already at 45,000. The response has been amazing. And this is not just about how they can sell on Amazon. This is how they improve their overall online business, how they can become more robust. And so the reason why I kind of end on this is I think big technology companies such as Amazon, such as Uber, such as Deliveroo, such as Nextdoor, all of these huge enabling technology platforms, they're boosting entrepreneurship. But then you have this beautiful kind of cyclical effect that the small businesses who are formed through these big platforms then want to head back onto the high street. They're selling well online, but they still want to meet their customers in person. They want to try that physical retail experimentation. So I end with this in terms of I think what we are doing is hopefully building that future pipeline. So when we can safely get back on the high street, how can digital save the high street? I think small businesses will get back onto the high street in a pop-up fashion. And I think we should embrace these technologies that are helping businesses do that. So hopefully that's been a helpful contribution to the discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Emma. And, and as uh, you were presenting, uh, the, the uh, question and answers, there, there were questions coming in from the delegates, uh, obviously energized by what uh, yourself, Jenny and Polly had said previously. So I, I'm pleased to say that we do have some questions uh, from, from delegates. And again, thank all three of you for really insightful presentations and things for all of us, I think, to reflect on. Uh, there's a lot to take away there. So I'm, I'm just going to head first uh, to a, a question, uh, which uh, I, I'll, I'll ask obviously all three of you to comment on, but I'll come to Jenny first, if that's okay. Uh, how do we begin to engage with those small businesses and get them to put their valuable time into doing what Polly has suggested, uh, 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 which obviously was about Polly's presentation. So I'm going to come to you first, Jenny, for that, if that's okay. Well, I'm probably the least retail expert <laughs> person on the panel, but certainly I've, I've been really impressed with the role that our business improvement district have played in terms of being that middle person between the actual businesses themselves and perhaps the authority and the university and people who can help. So, um, yeah, I'm afraid I don't, don't really have much of a, a comment on that one, I'm afraid, Julian. No, that, that, that's fine. Uh, uh, Polly. Oh, you're, um, you need to unmute. Schoolboy error, sorry. Um, I think it's one of those very, those challenges. What we find works best is that where you go into a place where you have somebody that wants to lead the charge. So we have programs and we have um, creative and campaigns that we can drop in any place because what you want to do is find um, we can spot the businesses that are performing well and the thing that works best is if you can find the business in the local area that can be the, 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 the figurehead of the campaign and then you use the data to show everybody else how those businesses that are doing well are trading better people go oh, I get it I understand I now know why that person's doing better than me so 
we base every campaign when we work with the local authority on this is what works and then we're helping you, everybody else follow in those footsteps because it's about changing behavior. It's not, most of this is not about technology. It's actually about helping people understand mm -hmm. how to use technology. Um, and the key, the key to that is show them that person's got more money in their till because they're doing these things, generally learn how to do it. And that's what works. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Emma? Yeah, very um, similar to Polly actually. So just in response to that question, attracting small business owners' attention is one of the hardest things in the world to do. They're busy people, of course, they're more busy now than ever because they're just figuring out how to deal with all these challenges. So my advice would be go to the places where they hang out at the moment. So uh, Enterprise Nation, of course, was built for that. Um, Polly just mentioned finding local people. We've got a network of um, 39 local leaders who operate in different localities across the UK. They host local meetups. They're still doing it, but now online. So uh, go to the places where small businesses hang out, co-working spaces, libraries, dare I say, are hosting lots of business sessions, platforms like Enterprise Nation, the local growth hub. So these are places to where small businesses gravitate. And if you want them to do anything, that's the best place to kind of put that message, outline the benefits. And then as Polly says, build in that kind of peer support because businesses are influenced by a couple of things. They're influenced by what experts such as accountants and their advisors tell them, but they're also of course influenced by what their peers tell them. So find out where your small businesses are already hanging out and kind of get that message through those two routes. Fantastic, some really interesting insights there. And I'm glad that a plug for the Growth Hub, uh, the Growth Hub working across Essex, uh, uh, which includes Essex, Thurrock and South Bend has been has been very instrumental in support of businesses uh, in recent times. And I've seen a big increase of, of businesses accessing a lot of the support and advice, uh, which I'm sure is replicated uh, across the country, across Hertfordshire and across other parts of, of the country as well. So fantastic, thank you for that. My next question, uh, we've got a question, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just read this through. Uh, we are a successful SME in hospitality. Our owners are early seventies. Our community has higher than average amount of people offline and that's that's come through via the data we haven't made a profit for seven months yet we've had to employ someone for four hours a day for two weeks to help customers use track and trace a, a very real experience uh, our customers don't know how to download an app what are national and local government doing to support us to learn new skills and find time to do this a very real uh, uh, question there i think uh, who would like to take that one first um, I'm happy to give that a start. Um, I mean, I think that sounds like a real challenge. It's funny, actually, what I thought you were going to say is I'm in hospitality. I want to find ways of reaching my customers in which my response was going to be. Look at things like Uber, look at things like Deliveroo, look at being a profile on Nextdoor so you can kind of keep your customers engage but the whole issue that you've referenced is if your customers are not using those technologies then you can't reach them through that route um I'll, I'll come back on to kind of what government is doing to help but maybe just one thing that you might want to consider and i know this sounds a little bit kind of left field but if your customers are not currently incredibly digitally savvy could you dare I say use your premises to try and encourage them to be digitally savvy? So one thing of course that customers are feeling at the moment and these are trends that small businesses are really looking at at the moment, more local shopping. And of course we've all really appreciated that. That's not looking as if it's gonna change because everyone's still staying home. So I think for local restaurants and hospitality venues when they can reopen safely, that's a really good customer group. Um, but also, of course, customers wanting things delivered to them. So could you at all even post flyers through your customer's door with kind of brief instructions? Because I just wonder if it's more the issue is around educating your customers to use these kind of digital tools so you can get your products to them. Um, of course, food delivered to the door, again, is just massively on the rise. But if you can encourage your customers to use those technologies, I think it would be helpful. And in terms of kind of, I can't speak what local government is doing, um, but I mean, I guess central government, and we've seen this over the past few months is, you know, the chancellor has tried to help this with the uh, eat out to help out, you know, and it's just, I, I constantly come back to, we work really closely with government and they've had a hard time from mm. lots of people saying, have they done enough for small business? But I have to say, I keep coming back to, they're in a really delicate and precarious position because 
they're trying to do good for the economy and good for our health. So they're always going to have to play that balancing out. But dare I say, my advice to you would be open up your doors, either physically or virtually. Uh, try and encourage your customers to buy from you more digitally, because for hospitality businesses at the moment, there are so many digital tools you can use to increase your customer base or indeed just engage with your current customers and let them know when you're reopening. Thank you very much. Uh, Polly? 100% agree. It's, 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 um, I think Emma's covered it beautifully, but it's about um, digital, digital education. There isn't, there isn't a happy way through this other than the tools are digital. So um, use it as an opportunity to, to, to embrace your customers some more. I just want to segue from that question into something which has also come through, which is uh, uh, one of our delegates has asked a question about Newcastle in particular, uh, Jenny, and, and they're, they're talking about our high streets generally and, and the properties in them, are they being transitioned into non-retail? Is that a way forward? Are you seeing any of that at the moment? Uh, it'd be very interesting for any insights around any changes around that on the high street. I'm really sorry, Julian. Retail is not actually my, my area of expertise. So uh, my involvement in how busy is too with actually bringing the partners together to bring that data to encourage people back to the high street. I do know that um, Polly, I think it was, did a webinar which did draw on some data from, um, from Newcastle a couple of weeks ago. So um, I'm afraid, again, I, I'm not able to, to comment on that, unfortunately. No, that, that's fine. It, it was related to Newcastle. And I just wondered if... Uh, if, if there was any insights about changes moving uh, to non-retail. But I wonder, Polly, if you could maybe pick up on any of that for us, uh, as you've obviously done a webinar, which you maybe referenced Newcastle in the past. Yeah, I think, I think we, Jenny, we recently visited Newcastle. We, as I said, we do this weekly um, webinar where we go to two places in the UK and look at what's the best performing post and explain why it's the best performing post. And it's, um, it's, it's great fun. Um, but as regards planning law, I'm afraid I'm not an expert on that, but I do know that there are uh, you know, and many people considering what is the future of you know, possible oversupply of retail space. Um, and I know it's one of the things that the High Street Task Force are looking at. Um, and, and it's very important that space is repurposed to have a use that helps you know, the community have a high street because it is going to change, um, but it's going to change to serve us as people better. And the way, the way to work out is what, what is that? Um, and I think, you know, everybody's having to change very fast and therefore planning will change, but that's not my, not, it's not in my gift. <laughs> I, I do want to come back to, uh, and, and ask Jenny a question, which is obviously non-retail related, <laughs> the best that I can, which, which is a bit of a magic wand question, if that's okay, Jenny, is in the sense, if you had a magic wand and you could transform one aspect of the relationship between high street and digital, what, in a sense, what would that be? If, it, if that was in your gift, what would that be? I think given what we've seen and where we've tried to you know, take data and present that back to people in a different way. My view would be for people to encourage organizations and businesses to keep their data up to date. So keep their uh, publicly available profile, their online presence up to date, you know, put in on, if, you, if you're on Google Maps, you can add information there about the COVID um, changes that you've made. You can put comments in there about how you've made uh, your area safer, you can change your, obviously your store times, make sure that the online information that you are sharing about your business is up to date and is openly accessible that allows people to access it in the way that they choose to do that. That would probably be, um, you know, the last thing we want to do is to be presenting back information or data that's that's out of date because then we get back into the, the trust issue and people don't actually believe what they're what they're being told. So keep your data up to date would be my uh, biggest tip, I think. I think you're still on mute, Julian. That's not, and very sound advice, thank you. Schoolboy error by the chair. The chair always wank, makes one mistake but in, in a webinar. Uh, Polly, if you had a magic wand. Um, I think actually I'm going to answer this along, along with Eddie's question. Um, there's been a question about, um, that I think I, I agree with him very much on, which is that my magic wand would be to say, um, Data and digital experience are now one thing. And so my magic wand would be to, to, to be to say, accept that the, that the consumer now has the technology in their hand. It's called a mobile phone. Let's get away with that for you. Um, and use the data that comes out of it to define a really agile experience because planning, ev everything, decision-making time has become shorter. As consumers, you've got what you want at your fingertips. So the less places can serve demand and what people want and high street can serve that demand and consumers will buy elsewhere um, 
And it's understanding that digital is not the enemy of the high street, but digital is actually the thing that can make the high street really, really work. Amazon is not the Amazon enemy. Amazon is an infrastructure that can make business work better. Thank you. Uh, Emma, have you had a, if you had a magic wand yourself in, in your gift, what would you like? I suppose it's really strange. I know this is um, we're on a digital um, session, but mine would be for landlords to open up their space. <laughs> so mine is quite a physical request, which is, um, yeah, as I say, kind of big friction for small businesses. How do they know who the landlords are? How can they convince them to open up their space for temporary use? And I still think, as I say, as soon as we get out of these uh, safety regulations, hopefully when um, things start to improve from a health perspective, um, small businesses, I do think, will be rampant in their want to get back onto the high street. So I guess my magic one would be, would all landlords be more receptive to that concept and start to consider temporary use in their spaces? Yeah. Uh, fantastic. We, we are nearly at, uh, at the end of the session. And I just got one final question, which is uh, just want to ask all of you, which is about uh, social media, uh, because it's something which has come up quite a lot across all three presentations. And, you know, for businesses who do not have any social media, how do, how do we work with them to give them the confidence to take the plunge? Polly. Yes, maybe. Can I say that? I mean, that's why we exist. It, it's the thing that, um, it's, why we, it's why we have built our platform, because it's like not having a phone. If you don't, if you don't engage with a customer um, in the channel that they're spending so much time, it's just, it's like not having a phone. You've just got to be there. So everything we do is about providing people the tools and the training to be able to connect with other business, learn how to engage. Social media is not about what you say, it's about how you join the conversation. There's more content and data out there than ever before. And if you can engage with the conversation where the customer, where your customers already are, you start to see results so quickly. And the minute people start, they learn and they see business results and it's a it's a it just it's a self-fulfilling prophecy it, it works thank you emma um i think i would say peer pressure um so uh, just if businesses are connected to each other and they see that everybody else is doing it uh, the fear of missing out will eventually business <laughs> so peer pressure but then also of course make sure that the skills are available but this is the thing again any business who says you know i want to do this but there's no support available there is so much support for small businesses to do more digitally at the moment so i think it is just that kind of nudge to encourage them of the benefits to do it and i think peer pressure is definitely a route to it thank you and and finally jenny I'm just going to end with listen to the experts. So people like Polly and Emma, uh, who clearly are uh, really well informed on this. Um, yeah, certainly take up all of the opportunities for support and training that are that are available um, and definitely get online. And I think that's great advice to finish the session as we as we now uh, approach into o'clock. Which just leaves me to 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 thank our three speakers today, Polly, Emma, and Jenny. I think there's an awful lot there uh, for all of us to take away to reflect on, and I'm sure people will can make contact with you individually if they if they if they need to. And I understand that the the webinar today will be uploaded, and so people can then go back. And, and look at their leisure. Uh, and also leads me to thank you to Mike and to colleagues through the Digital Innovation Zone for putting on such a very informative session with three experts, which I know all of us, myself included, especially me, have learned an awful lot today about our high street and how important it is, but how it can evolve. And I feel very positive. So thank you all three of you for an, an excellent session. So. And Julian, can I also just thank um, the three panellists? Um, it's been fantastic and uh, I can't thank you enough for, for coming along and supporting the event. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Julian. Thank you all. all Congratulations again, Mike. Thank well you. Thank done. you very much. <laughs> well done. Well done. Okay. Cheers. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.